short. They do it really long, right? Woo! That was excessive. I'm slightly lightheaded. And uh, then, if in round one, some guy fucking gets decapitated, it's like, well, the match was over in one round, wasn't it? It's not like you continue fighting after that. Just beating the sh out of a corpse. Ah, oh, welcome back, and this video is brought to you by the absolute legends over at Wear Athletic Greens, baby. Yes, you've heard me talk about Athletic Greens before. They're one of these sponsors where they send me the goods and they're like, you know, try it out ahead of time, make sure it's for you. I remember making it up the first time and it looks something like this. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> this is like one of those things I'm just gonna have to pound down, isn't it? Because you're like, you know it's healthy. You're like, you know it's got all those nutrients and minerals and stuff that you need. But you're like, what? I mean, okay, okay, but it's like protein shakes brilliant example you know after a workout you want to get some protein in you but they taste like absolute ass so i was like with this i was like okay okay nervously sipping on it and despite being this kind of dark green color it's absolutely delicious it's kind of got this like it tastes sort of sweet, but also kind of like vegetables at the same time, which you might be thinking, well, that's a bit weird. But it kind of reminds me of, you know, those delicious vegetable crisps you get, you know, that have beetroot and parsnip and all that delicious and carrot in. It kind of tastes like that. It's genuinely delicious. The reason I, I like it, I take it. You're often like, oh yeah, it will aid in your digestion and you'll feel a lot better. I'm like, honestly, my digestion works pretty good. Like, I don't know, I just eat stuff and it comes out the other end and I tend to do okay. The problem is with that. <laughs> It's like, so I don't tend to eat particularly well. And I definitely know I don't get all my vitamins and minerals. That's why Athletic Greens comes along. Because, you know, you can take a multivitamin, it's in a little pill. And all that stuff you read is like, oh, you know, that's not really good enough. It doesn't get all of it absorbed into your system. But not with Athletic Greens. This is the proper shizzle. And, uh, yeah, it tastes good. I make myself, I, this is in my office. I have a little mini fridge by my desk. Every morning I come in. I, I do it in ounces, which is really weird for me because I'm not American. You pour eight ounces of water in there. I add the... The, the scoop of greens it comes in this uh this tin thing i mean it doesn't you put the bag in the tin and then you scoop it out and uh, i just kind of sit down at the computer and have one every morning and uh they say like does it replace your coffee and i'm like no 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 <laughs> it's entirely in addition to my coffee but uh it's fantastic nonetheless and you should try it out i am absolutely certain that there are things they wanted me to say that i haven't said so let's investigate i said it was easy yes i showed the canister the scoop and the shaker i didn't sc show the scoop you know what a scoop looks like it's a scoop there's a free gift offer please use a strong verbal call to call to action do that athletic greens yes i can you're welcome go to the link in the description now to get a year's supply of vitamin d3 k2 and five travel packs for free with your first purchase ah that's what the extra stuff in the box was oh i brought the travel packs along there's not five in there anymore not that i traveled anywhere um just i wanted to see what it was like which was i guess a bit wasteful this is a game changer for supporting your immune system ag1 provides your body with everything it needs for optimal performance every single day i optimally perform i mean I, I do feel like I, I'm quite an efficient, optimal person, so yes! AG1 is going to give my community an immune-supporting free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Um, I absolutely did not plan on saying this, but I had like a, I had like a yearly medical, you know, where you go to check up and my vitamin D, this is an absolutely genuine story that I had no intention of selling. The last time I went for this was a couple of months ago. They were like, it's dangerously low. Like, you need to go to the pharmacy after this. They, they got my results. They emailed me a prescription because that's a thing nowadays. And we're like, go to the pharmacy and get this vitamin D and start taking it every day. And I was like, uh, okay. And it was like the only red thing on my blood work. And uh, yeah, so uh, obviously if I'd been doing that, then I wouldn't have had that problem. And then ironically, I'm not sure, but like two weeks later, I ended up breaking my bone, which I know vitamin D is good for the bones. What are we talking about? Is there a code you want me to read, Athletic Greens? No, apparently not. It's just in the description text below. So click below, please, and check out Athletic Greens. Why not? Don't be a dick. Don't let your vitamin D go down. It makes you feel good. It's nice to have something extra in your routine that is good for you. Yes, Athletic Greens. Now today's video. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your wonderful, fantastic, uh, brilliant host of this show and what happens here is Danny writes me a script I'm gonna read it Sam afterwards it's gonna sprinkle in some of the finest vintage memes that you've ever seen or modern memes whatever nobody minds as long as there is Skeletor I'm into that shit what this is dumbest video game controversies and I really feel like we've done this before 
So uh, I guess this is one of those episodes where I'm really creatively bankrupt and we'll just recycle some content. I mean, I'm sure there's new ideas. I, at least I hope there is, Danny, because otherwise you just sent me a script that we did before and expected me to pay you, which is uh, uh, a little bit disappointing. Don't let me break out that big whip. Oh my God, I remember when I was a kid, I went to like, I think it's the HMS Victory. It's like, I want to say it's Nelson's ship, but then I feel like I'm going to sound like a small brain when someone's like, what are you talking about, Simon? That's like 300 years different. It's this like old school ship that you can go and tour around. And it was like, there was this one bit about how they kept the sailors in line. And they had this whip called a cat of nine tails, which was basically a whip that then broke off into nine separate whips. And they'd be like, if that was nine times, I lost count. But I mean, God damn, why are we talking about this? Oh yes. Uh, no. I, oh yes, the punishment for Danny. Cat of nine tails. I have spit everywhere. You are made of stupid. You would think that it might have taken a while for politicians and parents to start pointing their fingers at the video game industry and blaming arcade machines for the downfall of civilization. After all, following the arrival of Pong in 1972, Pong is killing our children. Don't you see how violent it is? Come down, Anakin. These people are like the biggest boomers. Like they got that full boomer energy. Or it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grand Theft Auto made my child go on like a killing spree. It's like, no, no, no. Your shitty parenting made your child go on a killing spree. And also their brain was probably a bit f***ed up. But it's got nothing to do with violent video games. You f***ing boomer. <laughs> oh, and it's like, look, I know I've, I've sometimes got that boomer energy. And I'm like, I'm 34. I'm like not in that boom. My parents are boomers. But like sometimes a little bit of that boomer energy rubs off on me, but not in this regard. Okay, boomer. The graphics of a tip of great. We're four lines in, Simon, and uh, we've made basically no progress. The graphics of a typical arcade game were laughably primitive for a very long time, and they were even more basic on your less powerful home computer or console. Surely we'd have at least to reach the 1990s before graphics advanced to a stage where we could become offended and outraged by them. But I can remember the parents of my mate, Holmesy. Danny, you had a friend called Holmesy? I hope that's his surname, because otherwise he's gonna get bullied. Uh, banning him from playing the ZX Spectrum version of the game called Renegade as early as 1987 on the grounds that it was too violent. I remember when I left school and I found it a little bit weird that people called me Simon because through most of my life I was Whistler. Like, you know, teachers would call you Whistler, my friends would call me Whistler. They'd be like, hey Whistler! I'd be like, yeah, what's up? It was, it was, it was rarely used. Simon was rarely used, I feel. Simon! Marcelli. Surely we'd at least have to reach the 19... Uh, uh, banning from the ZX Spectrum version of the game called Renegade as early as 1997 on the grounds that it was too violent. I remember I had Doom. I think I've told this story before. I had Doom for the PlayStation. I must have been like 10, 11, and my parents were totally okay with me playing it. And uh, obviously, I haven't done any school shootings. So uh, I think it's pretty proven there that video games don't cause violence. It's true that Renegade was a beat-em-up game adapted from an original Japanese arcade title and the Spectrum conversion was a pretty decent port. But looking back now, it's hard to see how the monochromatic and simplistic little graphics could provoke so much anxiety in Holmesy's household. Holmesy? Holmesy? Danny, why? Couldn't you have just been like, yeah, 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 my mate, Ben? I mean, just give him like a, give him a fake name to make it easy on me. Just call everyone Ben. And don't do that, because like, I say it now. Like last, last episode, I complained that there, were, that there weren't page numbers. <laughs> and now I see that there are page numbers at the top of every page. <laughs> so I know Danny listens, but please don't make everyone in the stories Ben, because it will be confusing. <laughs> do I need to call you a wambulance? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> In fact, it seemed pretty ridiculous back then. Poor Holmesy often got ribs about it. But it, but he used to fight back the tears and pretend that he wasn't bothered because he was happy enough playing Graham's Gooch. <laughs> Graham Gooch's Desk Cricket. Speaking of people who get bullied because they've got a weird name, Gooch. <laughs> What's your name? Graham Gooch. And if you don't know what a Gooch is, I'd recommend Googling it. Don't do it. I'm pretty sure I know what it is. I'm pretty sure I know what a gooch is. And if I'm mistaken, well then, so you're looking up and be like, Simon, that's, it's not even offensive, but I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, not offensive, but it's like intimate. I'm a virgin. <laughs> Everyone be rapidly Googling gooch. 
But video games have been caught in controversy long before even then. The first eyebrow was raised only a year after the arrival of Pong. It should be noted that contrary to popular belief, Pong wasn't the first ever video game. Although coders had been mucking about with computer games since the 1950s, the first ever commercially released arcade cabinet was an incredibly rudimentary space combat game called Computer Space. In 1971, it was created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. I know these guys. We've covered them before. Uh, the duo had gone to launch Atari the following year. There we go. That is why. The game didn't perform as well as hoped and would be overshadowed by the first arcade game to be released by the brand's new Atari company in 1972. Pong would become the first massively successful arcade game and pretty much signified the beginning of the commercial video game industry. But that aforementioned first eyebrow was raised the moment that anyone dared to break away from the Pong format. Atari's fourth game, Gotcha, was released in 1973. This was about the 20th arcade game ever to be released, but nearly all of the others were simply variants on Pong. You know, Pong is released, everyone's like, well, we've done it, gentlemen. We have created the epitome of video games, and only people are only ever going to be making uh, variations on this forever because we've done it. We've done it. Can you imagine showing like Grand Theft Auto or, you know, I don't know, one of these new... I'm still like, I'm still... I realize Grand Theft Auto 5 is like now a 10-year-old game or something insane. It still looks amazing. Can you imagine showing that to someone in, the ni in like 1972 and being like, you see that Pong game you made? This is what it's going to be like in 50 years. Actually, 50 years sounds so far, I'd be like, what the f*** are the holodecks? <laughs> 50 years. Like, I know, like, 50 years from now, I really, I, I assume we'll have got holodecks sorted, right? Like, or like, VR that is so immersive we can't tell the difference from reality. But someone's just gonna be like, no, 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 we just got like 16k GTA 17. I'm like, oh, slightly disappointing. I thought we'd have, like, really made it as good as reality by then. Apparently not. The fuck is he talking about? Gotcha tried to deliver something a little different with the world's first ever arcade maze game. In this two-player title, one player takes on the role of the pursuer, while your buddy takes on the role of the pursued, and the simple objective is to chase and catch your opponents through a black and white maze. That actually sounds quite fun. The game is so prehistoric that the characters aren't even humanoid. The players are just represented by a square or a plus sign. But a small number of the games were produced in dazzling multicolor, so Gotcha also goes down in history as the first ever color game, even though these were, even though there are of these was very very limited some some like super like whatever came before boomer whoever the boomers boomers were it's gonna who are the boob boomer boomers the boomers boomers like the parents of the boomers like my grandparents they'll be like it glorifies get some help the pursuit of someone by a by a criminal it's like yes clearly what is happening here is this is a demonstration of the fall of society because the person being chased is clearly a rape victim and the person chasing them you know what's going to happen once they've caught them that's what this game is about it's about rape it's about ban it ban it now it goes against all my values i'm very sorry and i apologize for the inconvenience of me not giving up but the curious thing about Gotcha was how Atari initially marketed this and presented this simple maze game to the public. The strangely pink advertising flyer depicted a fully clothed man chasing a woman in a nightdress. Oh my god! I was right! Oh, the boomer boomers were right! And his arms around her waist suggested that he had won this round of Gotcha. I mean, um, that doesn't necessarily signify, like, anything untoward, is it? It'd be like, I'm sure I've chased my wife around the house that like, once or twice. And it hasn't ended in rape. It's just ended in with like, ah! Oh my god, it's so cringe. <laughs> my life is cringe. But even more curious is the... <laughs> so you just have to clarify that chasing your wife around the apartment doesn't end in rape, whistleboy. What the f***? <laughs> what the f***? But even more curious is the glimpse of the arcade cabinet next to these two players. The two controllers on the front look curiously like a couple of pink breasts. Okay, now I'm seeing why the Boomer Boomers got upset. And this was no accident. Atari's product designer, George Farrakos, had reasons that the traditional joystick looked a bit like a cock. So why not go with boobs for gotcha? The problem made the game... This pro... This probably made the game quite strangely difficult to control. Instead of just pushing a stick in the right direction, you kind of had to squeeze the pink domes to control the action on the screen. And the other person was just holding a dick. Like, ah, ah, ah. I'm sure Sam's got some choice memes for this moment. Our daddy taught us not to be ashamed of our dicks, especially since they're such good size and all. Hmm. 
And it does seem a bit odd that the Atari chose to theme a maze game around the concept of squeezing breasts to chase a woman in a nightdress. Initial sales were a bit flat, and Atari quickly decided to replace the pink domes with standard joysticks. But bearing in mind that there were only 19 other arcade games in existence at this time, we're unlikely to ever again witness a period in which 5% of all arcade games in the world had boobs for controllers. Brilliant. Gotcha only really provokes a mild sniff of disapproval from concerned citizens the boomer boomers though mainly because not many people were aware that it existed just three years later in 1976 the sick and twisted video game industry was destined to get dragged into its first ever major scandal my bionic ass almost came out there fortunately safely plugged back in mm. If you're new to this channel, you're like, what is a biotic ass? <laughs> what is going on? And I'm not going to explain it. We're just going to move on to Death Race. You're a coward, you know that? This was two years before even the Space Invaders had descended. And on the face of it, there seems to be little about Death Race that would whip up controversy. Exidy released the title in 1976 with low expectations, as it was only ever meant to be an interim game before the launch of their next biggie the following year. Death Race was really just a quick tweak of an older game called Destruction Derby. Players Derby? Destruction Derby? Because I feel like there's a place in the UK called Derby. It's spelt Derby, but it's pronounced Derby. So I want to say Destruction Derby, but it could be Destruction Derby. Oh my God, who cares? Not me. Let's move on. Players would grab hold of the steering wheel, stick their foot on a pedal, and guide the little car around an overhead view of a largely empty monochromatic single screen. The little twist this time round is that you're meant to run over little creatures called gremlins in order to stack up points. Every time you run over a gremlin, the arcade machine emits a little squeal, and the character turns into a tombstone. Holy shit. <laughs> Who gives a gremlin a tombstone? It's not even real. Hilarious. It's often wrongly reported that the game was an unofficially licensed adaptation of the film Death Race 2000 released just a year earlier. Well, it's called Death Race, isn't it? I wonder if you... Can you, like, trademark that? I mean, probably not, because it's just two words, like, Death Race. Did Apple trademark Apple? Because I feel that it's just a word, right? Weird. Who cares? In that controversial classic starring David Carradine and Sylvester Stallone, motorists participate in bloodthirsty racing events in which they're rewarded with bonus points for randomly killing innocent pedestrians. Holy sh**. What the f Could it be that Exidy just decided to turn a gory and questionable sport into an arcade game? Danny, gory and questionable sport? You make it sound like there's something people really do. Well, that might have been the original intention, although the game was not officially linked to its namesake film. It's interesting to note that the working title of the game was simply Pedestrian, where you murder pedestrians. <laughs> Oh, dab on them! <laughs> However, XD clearly had a change of heart when they decided to give the day game a dark fantasy theme by plastering the cabinet in vivid artwork depicting skeletons and ghouls. They weren't these weren't the humans you were running over, they were monsters who had it coming. <laughs> and the gremlins are like, no, please, I'm so sorry, I didn't me ah! <laughs> Like, we're just trying to be helpful. We're like the Dobby creature from Harry Potter. We just want to support. <laughs> oh, sh**. It's like that Terry Pratchett book, uh, for uh, Only You Can Save Mankind. Is that what it's called? Where the guy, he's playing this video game and then he has dreams which turn out to be real or something like that. That the creatures are, uh, they're actually alive. And he's like, you just keep, you keep killing us. You've killed so many of our civilization. And he's like, it's just a game. Will you kill me all the time? And they're like, yes, but you keep coming back to life. It's like, oh, no. You've committed an alien genocide. There's a weird book. You see what I'm saying? You got to think, partner. You don't what want to- What the fuck are you talking about? The problem was that it was quite hard to tell either way, as the alleged gremlins were just tiny, bloody match, tiny, blocky matchstick men. So when you slammed the pedal to the floor and ran over another squealing victim, it could be perceived that you were mindlessly mowing down humans in the name of entertainment. Except they're not humans, and it's a video game. Even if they were humans, it'd be like, oh, it's a video game, isn't it? Again, I'll bring it up. Number of people I've run over in GTA, thousands. Number of people I've run over in real life, fucking zero, you boomers. Zero, zero, zero. Hey, and this is what was going through the minds of mainstream media when they ran scathing reports on the mindless violence of this new monstrosity, along with condemnations from magazines and newspapers, including the National Enquirer and the New York Times, the 60 Minutes show on CBS, uh, ran an in-depth report on how this sick and morbid game was subverting the innocent minds of our children, all for f**k's sake. 
Gerald Dreesen, a behavioral psychologist from the National Safety Council, expressed his own concerns during the report. He said, TV violence is passive. In this game, the player takes the first step on creating violence. I'm sure most people playing this game do not jump in their car and drive at pedestrians. One in a thousand? <laughs> One in a thousand people who play this game, Derek. Really, one in a thousand go out there and mow down pedestrians. How many people live in America? 300 million? Yeah, so 300,000 people are just out there mowing down pedestrians after playing this game, Derek. Derek, you f***ing moron. One in a million. I shudder to think what comes next if this is encouraged. Ah. <laughs> Derek. Ah. Bell. Allegedly. Oh, was his name not Derek? No, it was Gerald. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I went to Derek. Maybe because his name was Dreesen. Gerald Dreesen. Derek. Derek. Der I don't know. What's wrong with me? I'm just, a, I'm just an idiot. If Gerald was concerned about the psychological impact of little cars running over matchstick men, I'd love to hear what he thought of Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> it's like, no! This is everything wrong with society! Thankfully, no fatalities were ever recorded as a consequence of playing Death Race. Shocking. And although many sources claim that the arcade game was swiftly pulled following the controversy, this isn't true at all. The game was only ever meant to have a limited shelf life anyway, and XD reported that sales doubled in the aftermath of the media reports. That is not shocking at all. It doesn't surprise me in any way. If the video game industry learned a valuable lesson from this, it certainly wasn't the lesson that Gerald and the mainstream media had been pinning their hopes on. Yeah, obviously not, because you know what's working really well? Ultra-violent video games. Barbarian. Home computer games in the UK in the late 1980s appeared to have quite a thing for Page 3 Girls. We've already mentioned in a previous Brain Blaze on video games how the most famous Page 3 Girl of the era, Sam Fox, lends her name and digits to a wo woeful version of strip poker. And possibly inspired by subsequent publicity, the second most famous Page 3 Girl of the era, Maria Whittaker, lends her image to the packaging of a controversial game released just one year later in 1987, but the fuss kicked up by concerned critics and anxious parents in the UK was so fixated on Maria's body that it appeared to completely miss the bigger picture. Oh no! Originally released for the Commodore 64 by Palace Software, Barbarian, the Ultimate Warrior, was later ported to just about every system around at the time. Inspired by the look and feel of Conan the Barbarian, it was a pretty impressive one-on-one -on -one combat game with both players emerging from opposite ends of the screen, assuming the roles of muscle-bound barbarians in a gory sword duel. Uh, it's so sad that this has just been around for so long that people will make, it just makes, you know, I feel like this was something that I grew up with where, you know, boomers would complain about violent video games and it's just been going on forever. So now we can just completely ignore it, can't we? That would be perfect, let's just completely ignore it. I mean, and let's let, I mean, okay, we shouldn't completely ignore it because games like General Custer's Revenge exist, which is just like, oh my God, what? <laughs> That needs to be banned, and I don't feel like a boomer saying that in any way whatsoever. That game was just like, I, was, I remember reading that, I was like, what the fuck? That needs to be banned, that's my boomer energy, but also my morally correct energy. Okay, boomer. In the one-player side story mode, the object of the game was to get through several rounds of combat in order to rescue Princess Mariana from the evil wizard Drax. And it was the depictions of the heroic barbarian and Princess Mariana on the box packaging that aroused all the attention. Whereas the overwhelming majority of software packaging at the time features specifically commissioned artwork, Palace decided to go with a photographic cover for this release. The muscly, sword-wielding barbarian wearing nothing but a loincloth was portrayed by Michael Van Widjik, who was unknown at the time but would go on to find fame under the snappier name of Wolf in the 90s sports entertainment game show Gladiators. I wasn't allowed to watch Gladiators when I was a kid because my parents said it was too violent. I guess that's what, I mean, yeah, my parents are boomers. <laughs> but let, let, yes, I could play Doom. What a weird world we live in. Meanwhile, posing seductively by his side, Princess Mariana was portrayed by Mariana Whittaker wearing a skimpy purple bikini. I also wasn't allowed to watch uh, the other one uh, with the fighting people in the colorful costumes. Power Rangers! I wasn't allowed to watch Power Rangers because it was too violent. But again, I was allowed to play Doom. <laughs> 
And for extra value, the box also came with a massive free poster featuring two characters in a slightly different but equally revealing pose. The cover sparked moral outrage from indignant parents, religious bodies, and even some game reviewers. The letters pages of just about every computer magazine at the time were flooded with complaints about this ugly pornography, which was offensive and particularly insulting to women. One writer for PC World dismissed the game as a trashy controversy magnet featuring a glamour sauce pot and a big bloke in a leotard. <laughs> that PC writer, PC World writer, is probably like extremely nerdy. <laughs> And he's just sitting at being like, I don't like that there are attractive people in this video game. It makes me very upset and I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> I'm not jealous of Wolf's amazing guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. Describing the cover as pornography is a little bit over the top. Maria Whitaker was actually wearing more than you would usually expect, and a paperboy of the time would have seen a lot more of Princess Mariana if it bothered to turn over the front cover of the Sun newspaper. And believe me, the paperboys did exactly that. Describing the cover, uh, whoops. But the more interesting point is that most of these concerned UK citizens were so outraged at the sight of a woman in a bikini that they completely overlooked the unusual levels of violence and gore in the actual game. I'm pretty sure my mate Holmesy would have never. Holmesy? Holmesy. Would. Oh, why are we getting so hung up on this dude's name? Would never have been allowed to play it in a million years. Although the cartoonish graphics might seem primitive by today's standards, they still depicted a surprisingly big bucket of blood and guts. In one of the trickier moves to pull off, you could perform a spinning sword attack which actually chops off the head of your opponent and brings the fight to an early finish. Yeah, no shit. It'd be like, and it's a boxing match. I don't know how they do. I've never seen a boxing match, so it's like, you know, they're like, oh, They do it really long, right? Woo! That was excessive. I'm slightly lightheaded. And uh, then, if in round one, some guy fucking gets decapitated, it's like, well, the match was over in one round, wasn't it? It's not like you continue fighting after that. Just beating the sh out of a corpse. At this point, a Green Goblin character appears to clear up the mess and kicks the bloodied head around the floor like a football. Classy Green Goblin. Class classy. But decapitated heads rolling around the floor were deemed to be perfectly acceptable in the UK. Just save our children from the sight of a woman in a bikini. It was a different situation in Germany, where the criticism was focused on the game rather than the packaging. In fact, yeah, because I know about Germany, they, like, now, like, porn is everywhere. But I remember being a kid and hearing, like, in German, in Germany, they have a porn channel. They'd be like, what? <laughs> like, on TV? <laughs> That's not, like, Sky Channel 998 or whatever? Weird. Oh god, I'm so lost. This doesn't surprise me. In fact, Barbarian ended up in a legal battle over its excessive violence, although the first case was thrown out when the prosecution was unable to demonstrate the tricky head chop maneuver in court. Second time around, they wisely decided to bring in a kid who could actually play the game, and Barbarian was swiftly restricted in Germany to adults only. However, Palace were equally swift in getting around the German ban by changing the color of the blood from red to green, which apparently made it acceptable to kiddies again. Of course, all of this controversy only helped boost sales of Barbarian, which topped the software charts for months. And it was so successful that a more adventure-based sequel appeared on the shelves the following year. And this time, Princess Mariana wasn't just a helpless damsel in distress. She was a playable character in a metal bikini armor who was equally handy with a sword. Oh my. This seems like something from a bad fantasy game. Like Metal Bikini Armor, it's like, brilliant. That Metal Bikini is protecting your breasts. Which is great to protect. But what about your abdomen? I'm pretty sure there's some useful s*** in there, like liver, spleen, intestines, kidneys, all sorts of other s*** that I've forgotten that we have inside us. Ha! Gay! Lungs. They're a bit higher up though, aren't they? They're higher up than the abdomen. Right? Lungs are like here. And all the other s*** down. Why do I not know? Stomach. Stomach. Ah. But it looked as if Palace had taken some criticism on board when it came to packaging for Barbarian 2, The Dungeon of Drax. The front cover featured a simpler photograph of a broken sword lying next to an umbrella stand. But <laughs> what? No, I'm only kidding. Okay, they wheeled out Maria and Wolf again to strike a pose and chucked in another big free poster. Yes, and back in the day before pornography was just widely available everywhere, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm buying the game for the game, not the giant poster with the semi-nude woman on it. Right? <laughs> Super Monaco GP. 
Oh, I just saw. Like, did I mention this before? I watched that Drive to Survive TV show about Formula One racing, and I'm like, it's so good. I, I didn't really follow at all Formula One, and now I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> I totally get this sport. Before I was like, wait, they just race around a track? And it's like, no. It's way more complicated than that. It's awesome. Such a good watch. It's on Netflix. The video game industry... Just... The video game industry... Ugh, ugh. <coughs> Sorry, I do drugs. The video game industry might be trying to pollute the minds of our children, but at least other more wholesome industries are doing everything with their power to fight back on our behalf. Like the tobacco industry, for example. Thank goodness for Philip Morris International. I always knew they had our backs. In 1989, Sega released one of the biggest arcade hits of the year, Super Monaco GP. And it's clear that racing games had already come a long way since the days of Death Race. The overhead monochromatic displays had been replaced by colorful, high-octane 3D racing from an immense, immersive cockpit experience. Yeah, that's a bit of a leap, isn't it? I'm sure it was still in 1989, but it is like the, the big, it's a big difference. At the time, the realism and attention to detail in this Formula One simulation was jaw-droppingly impressive. The cars even whizzed past the kind of advertising banners from the spon real sponsors that you'd see on a real track. But these were just parody banners designed to replicate the look and feel of a familiar brand. For example, a banner that looks at first class to represent Ford actually spells photo when you squint a bit harder. Yeah, this makes... Uh, I mean, I always found this a bit weird. I'd be like, yo, if I was Marlborough, like, I'd be doing anything I can to get into this game. I'd be like, yo, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, you could absolutely... Uh, let's not say Marlborough. I mean, even though they famously sponsored Formula One until they couldn't anymore, and then they were involved in some whole shady business about how can we still make it look like we fought sponsored Formula One. And then there's the, the uh, Ferrari, a sponsor by something called Mission Winnow. There was, I watched a YouTube video about this, like, who is Mission Winnow? And it's basically Marlborough. I think it's Marlborough, or uh, whoever owns Marlborough own Mission Winnow. Mission Winnow does any, any, does nothing. It's just a company that does nothing, but they still pump tons of money to have their nothing company name on Ferrari. It's all very mysterious, and it's like, why are you doing this? Just because people will look it up, they'll see that it's owned by Marlboro, and then be like, oh, you know what I'd like to do? Smoke. <laughs> I don't understand. But if I was Marlboro, I'd be very keen to have my brand in this game, because as we all know, video games played by children, and children are the customers of tomorrow. It's why I've said for a long time I will have to start a children's game at, uh, game. <laughs> children's YouTube channel at some point to bring in the viewers of tomorrow. Because at some point, you're all going to grow old and die. But I guess then I'll also be old and dead. So I won't have to worry about it anymore. Woo! <laughs> Canon becomes Conan and Marlboro becomes Marbobo. <laughs> and this latter example is the point in the race where the wheels came off for Sega. But up, 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 tsh! Dr. John W. Richards from the Medical College of Georgia was the first to get a bit stroppy. He filed a formal complaint to the FTC, which accused Super Monaco GP of essentially being just one huge advertisement for Marlboro cigarettes. It's Marlboro, you idiot! Which obviously makes everyone think of Marlboro way more than Mission f***ing Winnow. <laughs> Uh, he reckons that a skillful player would be exposed to hundreds of Marlboro adverts during a long session with extended plays, and even a really crap player would see at least 50 of them. The complaint seemed of little consequence and didn't really get anywhere. Is it going to be that Marlboro is actually paid for by Balboa? Uh, it could be argued the kids of the time would also be exposed to tobacco advertising if they just turned on Formula One racing along with a handful of other big tobacco sponsored sports on the TV. Yes, they'd also be exposed to tobacco advertising when they walked down the street or looked at a newspaper because tobacco advertising was entirely legal. Like, I remember as a kid, there'd be giant billboards advertising cigarettes. I mean, they'd have a giant thing at the bottom saying, like, smoking will f***ing kill you and your children. But, like, most of it was still, like, a big advertisement for smoking. And it's like, what the f***? I can't believe I was alive and I remember this time. It's going to be one of those things where I'm like 90, hopefully. And uh, I mean, obviously I'm going to live forever because I'm going to be frozen. But like when I'm really old and sh getting all like f***ed up from age, I mean, like, I remember when you could, uh, when smoking was advertised on the streets. And people would be like, whoa, you're old, man. <laughs> But it was this complaint that got the arcade game noticed by Philip Morris International for the first time, and they were hopping mad, allegedly. PMI was apparently horrified that something resembling their brand of death sticks had been plonked into a game that innocent children might play. play. Yeah, I bet you were horrified, Philip Morris International, until someone leaks like an internal memo, and it's like a massive check that you've written to this company to have your brand in there as like something else. After several sleepless nights of worrying about whether these poor misguided children might actually end up buying 
buying their product as a result of Sega's thoughtless actions, PMI felt that they had no choice but to sue Sega. For trademark infringement, they demanded a full recall of the game, undisclosed financial compensation, and the destruction of all relevant material associated with Super Monica Co. GP. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but wait a minute. What the f*** is going on? And why the f*** is Philip Morris International the good guy? How dare you! A settlement was eventually reached in 1992, which certainly caused a major headache for Sega. They agreed to run a series of full-page ads in the press, which encouraged arcade owners to return the original version of the game uh, chips in exchange for replacement chips, which had had the Marbobo branding removed. Each arcade owner would also be given $200 for their trouble, so it wasn't a bad deal for them. Following the agreement, the senior vice president for corporate affairs for PMI voiced his approval. This settlement is important to Philip Morris because it effectively eliminates our Marlboro brand logos from a video game used by children. What the f***? This makes no sense, Philip Morris International. You, you're not the good guy. You're supposed to be the villain. Bollocks, allegedly. Some would argue that PMI had forced Sega to jump through these massive financial hoops for just the sake of their own sleazy publicity stunt, which was designed to make the brands appear morally conscious while simultaneously generating healthy press coverage. Yeah, but they also got it removed from a game. So it's win-win. It's interesting to know that PMI originally asked for a log of all completed con conversions of the original cabinet so they could figure out how many rogue cabinets with spoof branding were still out there. But it looks as if they never followed up on this, presumably because once the publicity stunt had reached the checkered flag, but a bum bum tum, they couldn't really give a cough and spit anymore. Oh, but a bum bum shh. Uh, so yeah, I was fully expecting it to end with like the leaked memo and this was like they paid for it to be in there and then they paid, sued for it to get removed as like a part of a big publicity stunt, but no. I, it may have been a publicity stunt, but this is the closest that Ferret Mollis International has ever come to being the good guy. Night Trap. December 1993 heralded a significant milestone in the video game industry as the United States Senate Committee turned its attention to the corrupting influence of video game nasties on our children. They'd clearly had enough of matchstick men slaughter, decapitation, women in bikinis, and the subversive advert, and subversive adverts for cigarette brands that don't even exist. Now was the time for action. And it was this hearing that ultimately led to the formation of the Entertainment Software Rating Board, or ESRB, the system still used today, which slapped content ratings and potential age restrictions on every new cus consumer release in North America in much the same way as the film rating system. The hearing had two particular titles in its sights which represented the embodiment of the contemporary video game bloodbath. One of them was Midway's brutal beat-em-up Mortal Kombat. The other was Night Trap. I've heard of Mortal Kombat. I've never heard of a Night Trap. And it was Night Trap that ended up making the United States Senate Committee look like clueless buffoons. Which, I mean, honestly, it probably isn't that hard. Because any times the United state senate committee do anything with technology it's like bro <laughs> you like you fucking kidding me that's the one where it's like the guy there's that famous clip of the bro being like uh yo um yeah so my daughter got some adverts on her iphone that i didn't think were very appropriate and it's the ceo of like google <laughs> or like microsoft or something <laughs> and it's just like Congressman, uh, iPhone is made by a different company, and so, you know, I mean... Uh, I it might have been an Android. I, it's just, it was a hand-me-down of some kind. God damn American politicians, or just politicians in general. Could you, like, could you just be more out of touch? It just is like, what the f*** are you doing? They have these things, we've talked about them before, I assume it's like, you know Mark Zuckerberg, he has to go and testify in front of the Senate or whatever. I think he legally has to do that. They have these things called parliamentary inquiries in the UK, which is a similar thing where it's like, when someone does something super f shady, they're like, come in front of parliament and answer our questions. And it's an entirely voluntary thing. <laughs> it's almost like, Simon Business Plays is corrupting the youth. Come and answer questions in front of parliament. I'll be like, a f*** off. <laughs> And I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't even live in Britain anymore. But if I was, and they asked me to, I'd be like, um, no, I'm busy. And I don't give a <laughs> If you really want to stop me, legislate against me. Go ahead, then I'll have to obey you. But until we get there, you can... Oh, there's a ch choice expletive there. <laughs> Developed by Digital Pictures and given a relatively low-key release for the Sega CD in 1992, Night Trap was an early example of a full-motion video game. For the most part, it was a bit like watching an old movie, but with limited interactivity. Oh, okay, I sort of read that implying, like, older movies had interactivity. 
They don't. It's just like you're watching an old movie that has some limited interactivity. So I just said the same thing again. But you, you get my meaning, right? Sab's probably going to introduce that meme where it's like, what the hell is he talking about? And I, I, I'm going to be like, oh, God. Whenever that, or whenever Sam introduces that one, or the one where he's like, uh, what's the other one? Where he's Mr. Bean falling asleep. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I haven't made it entertaining enough. Even my video editor is bored. Do I need to call you a wambulance? Wah, 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 wah. The idea of the game was to project, uh, protect a house full of hapless teenage girls from a group of murderers who had infiltrated the building. You did this simply by flicking through several cameras in the house, depicting the live surveillance footage, and clicking on icons at the right time to prevent the death of another victim. It might sound a bit pants, but it was still more interactive and playable than Dragon's Lair. The game was noticeable for featuring Dano Plato in a Dano Plato, no idea who that is, in a leading role, a familiar face at the time, as she'd been a teenage star of the US sitcom Different Strokes, but with an apostrophe. For instead of an I, which I don't understand. Different, 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 different. I am a different person. I'm not <laughs> okay, yeah, I get it. Okay, fine, but why? Between 1978 and 1986, before turning to figure skating, soft porn movies, movies, and later tragically dying from a prescription drugs overdose at the age of 34. Okay, that's depressing. Night Tramp already looked a bit dated and cheesy in 1992, and this was partly because the footage had actually been filmed five years earlier for a game originally intended to be released on a doomed console called the Control Vision, which never actually made it into the shops. And although the footage... <clears throat> Excuse me. And although the footage reportedly cost a million dollars to put together, it looks and feels more like a daytime soap opera with terrible acting from a largely inexperienced cast. But Senator Joseph Lieberman... Oh no, here we go. Wasn't interested in the backgrounds of the game or the pedigree of the actors. During the congressional hearing, he slammed this ultra-violent game, which promoted a culture of carnage. Oh, you f Boomer. Tastic. Boomer. The senator complained that the game exploited naked women and gory violence, endorsed violence towards women. Endorsed violence towards women. Yes, he really said that. What a idiot! Oh, what a loser! Encourage players to trap and kill women, holy shit. And was in conclusion a disgusting offensive game that should not be shown to civilization. The video game encouraged viewers to trap women. You f***ing shitting me, Senator. You f***ing idiot. This led to Night Trap becoming a target for the, vit uh, for the vitriol of the US media, as the sicko game was plastered all over the front of newspapers amid calls for the game's immediate ban. Just a couple of points, though, said it to Joseph Lieberman's words of condemnation, may have proved more credible if it actually bothered to play the game or even conduct just the slightest bit of f***ing research. It's true that Night Trap might not be the most tasteful game to ever be developed. There is something slightly sinister and voyeuristic about watching fictional surveillance footage of a group of young, often scantily clad women in mortal peril. But the senator and the subsequent newspaper reports appear to have misread the point of the game. The player is not, as they suggested, meant to ensnare and kill the characters. You're supposed to be saving their lives. Yes, this was mentioned in like the first line of this entry. Can you read, my son? And there was absolutely zero nudity or realistic violence or even a single drop of blood in the whole game. What did you describe it as? Ultra-violence. A culture of carnage. What the hell is even that? Oh my god, Jesus Christ. The Night Trap was more like a camp horror movie from the 1950s in which the most disturbing element is a woman getting dragged away off scene, off screen to an unseen fate. This appeared to have escaped the attention of the hearing though, and the formation of the SRB, which probably was probably a sensible idea, was based on a big dollop of misreporting and lazy ignorance. <laughs> uh sir, so the iPhone is made by a different company. Ah! Ah! Predictably, sales of Night Trap only went through the roof after the immediate aftermath of the media frenzy. Uh, but the fortunes of the game were to be quickly slashed. Later that same month, major retailers, including Toys R Us and KB Toys, pulled the game from their shelves, and just a few weeks later, Sega voluntarily ceased production of the title. This seems a little unfair, considering that both Toys R Us and KB were still more than happy to sell copies of their other game under deep congressional scrutiny. Mortal Kombat hadn't kicked up such an immediate fuss, uh, even though the realistic digitized graphics depicted a player ripping out the heart of a defeated opponent. Now that is ultra-violence. 
Night Trap may have temporarily disappeared, but the game has been re-released in recent years to very little moral outrage on a range of modern systems, including the Nintendo Switch. That's a particularly ironic release as Nintendo's Vice President of America had attempted to suck up to the United States Senate Committee back in 1999 by de- 1993, sorry, by declaring that something as distasteful as Night Trap would never appear on a squeaky clean Nintendo system. It's okay, we can change our minds. But the Night Trap scandal did seem to trouble the game's original developer, Rob Fulop. He decided that he never wanted to be accused of corrupting the nation's youth again, and ended up launching a super cute and sickly sweet but hugely successful pets franchise in which young kids are encouraged to raise and care for their own virtual pets. Yeah, because I'm sure getting dragged in front of the United States Senate is quite stressful. <laughs> so- why am I here answering for something that I don't even think is wrong? And then you'll be like, yeah, even though I didn't think it was wrong and I think they're all idiots, I'm not going to do it again because it's just not fun. Keep an eye out for the forthcoming special edition, which you can train your chain smoking Labrador to steal a Formula One car and take it on a joyride through a busy pedestrian mall. Yes! Very, it's very easy to unplug my bionic ass today for some reason. What? This has been an episode of Business Bla- oh, oh, Thanks, boy. Come on. Come on! Brainblaze, thank you so much for watching. Um, Yes, you can purchase some merch if you like at purchasethemerch.co. I'm not sure if this uh, free Danny t-shirt will be still available by the time you see this video. It was only available for a month. Uh... And there's also the Keep Danny t-shirt, which I'm not wearing right now, which I suppose I should be. Because if you buy free Danny, the money goes to Danny. If you buy Keep Danny, the money goes to me. It's only available for a month. There'll be links below if it's still available. It might not be. Thank you for watching. And the other person is just holding a dick. Like, ah, ah, ah. I'm sure Sam's got some choice memes for this moment. Our dad had taught us not to be ashamed of our dicks. Especially since they're such good size and all. Hmm.